Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start. Now, let me just say a couple of things just to just to reemphasize how things work. I, I have. Uh oh. Oh, okay, uh, we just got a, we all just, all of us got an email about COVID and I thought, uh oh, that might mean we're postponing, we're going to be online next week, but that's not what it says. But anyway, let me, uh, let me, uh, how do I do the share screen again? <sighs> it's hell being my age. Just trust me, it's absolute hell. Um, here's the syllabus, right? Can you, everyone see that? We're talking today about what's going on in the American Yacht chapter. That's what your discussion questions, these questions were from, right? I haven't written out the discussion questions for this day or for this day because I wanted to see how you did. And if you hadn't prepared for today, then I was gonna to have to write questions that are different, but also assign people to them. So uh, that's, that's always a pain. It's a pain for you too, because I'll say, Josh, answer this question. And then you gotta do it right on the, on the, on the hop there. So uh, the, the module will look like this. The module looks like this, right? This is, this is this morning's module. Yours will look like this soon. There's a discussion agenda lecture. I, I put Birth of a Nation up here uh, because uh, this is a link to the film Birth of a Nation. Uh, let's see if I can get it to come up. Yeah, because this is an extremely important part of uh, American history. Um, um, so I want, I want you, if you have time to, to watch that. Uh, and then this then is a recording. You'll have one of these for your group, a recording of this discussion class will go on to the module. Okay. Also in the module will be your discussion for Tuesdays, the discussion agenda for Tuesday and the discussion agenda for Thursday. Okay. All right. Okay. Is that clear? All righty. Well, let's go. Let's beat the eight thirty class like a drum. Let me let me start by saying, you know what what I've I've kept saying so far. Reconstruction is uh, as Madison says. Other people have said it. So unbelievably complicated, but it's unbelievably important because it talks about, because it is, the effects of re reconstruction are with us 150 years later. Um, you know, reconstruction for all, all sorts of reasons to fails and then sets up a kind of uh, one party South Africa racist state, racial state that lasts until frankly 1965. So that's um, that's why it's I want to spend more time on it and that's why it's so important. So for an awful for generations and generations of African American people, nothing gets better and the rug keeps getting pulled out from under them. We'll get to that the, the, those details later in the in the discussion but uh I, I just want you to know that you know uh this is where an awful lot of the problems that we face in our country uh start from and it's it's really shocking that they that a that they weren't solved at that time but that they're that they weren't even solved in the subsequent decades okay that's one of the reasons by the way so many historians people who study history when they're going in for their PhD concentrate on reconstruction because it's so interesting and so fascinating and so difficult and so so complicated and so important right all right so let's start off what important pieces of legislation were passed during reconstruction 
and how did they change American life? Gia, Gianna, is that how I pronounce it? Gianna, you're, are you raising your hand? Yeah. Um, okay, shoot. For, they like abolished slavery with the 13th Amendment, and then also they passed the 14th and the 15th Amendment. Okay, what were, what were the 14th and 15th Amendment about? Now, technically, um, one, 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 just one technical thing is highly technical. The 13th Amendment technically was passed during the war. Uh, so it's kind of a war amendment, and the 14th, 15th were Reconstruction Amendments. But, but 13, 14, 15 are all together. They're very important to, to think about them together, to think about them uh, being in this period. So go ahead. And then for the 14th, that was like ensuring the constituity. And then 15th was that you can vote no matter like race, color, or anything like that. Uh, what do you mean ensuring the... I don't know. That's just what I like wrote down. So I don't, I don't know. Um. Well, someone else jump in. What? What? Uh, give us a better, uh, um, a fuller explanation of the Fourteenth Amendment. Wasn't that when it was established that birthright citizenship and equal protection under the law? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, birthright citizenship means, of course, everyone in the United States who's born in the United States or born of American parents is a citizen, and then the 15th Amendment does what? Um, the 15th Amendment prohibits states from denying citizens the right to vote based on race, color, or prior status of servitude. So this gave black men the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, remember with all these reconstruction amendments and these things, when it comes to voting, we're still talking about men only. And this becomes a bone of contention, by the way, with a, with a lot of the female suffragists of this period who say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, well, how come women can't, can't be given the vote as well? So that's an, that's an interesting interplay from the time of the 13th Amendment all the way to the time of the 19th Amendment. Shane. Um, didn't it also force the uh, abolition of black hoods? Um, no. What, the 14th Amendment? Or was that the, um, the first uh, Reconstruction Act? Well, there are Civil Rights Acts and there are Reconstruction Acts that try to, that try to water down Black codes, but they don't really work. So one of the problems with the Black codes is that they're, you know, they apply mainly to things that are already under, this, under the control of the states. And so the states can get away with murder in, on all kinds of things. Um, and we'll get to that when we talk about voting um, in a minute. But is it, is it any wonder to any of you that in the aftermath of something as terrible as the Civil War that there are, boom, one, two, three big constitutional amendments in a row? This is the only time this has ever happened. Obviously, when they're first writing the Constitution and they come up with the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, that happens all at more or less boom at the same time, but um, the Constitution had yet to be had yet to be ratified. So uh, I can't think of any other period in American history where there are three constitutional amendments so quickly. But again, is that surprising given what had, had just happened? Uh, Emily, you're shaking your head. Alice, Alice, you're shaking your head. especially since they were like in the middle of such huge ch cultural change, it's going to affect the government one, one way or another. So it was just gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, someone was talking about before how complicated reconstruction is. One way to break reconstruction down and try to understand what's going on is to break it into periods. The first is, radical reconstruction the second is presidential reconstruction and the third period is kind of like this mixture of 
how we're going to get through the rest of, of fixing all this in theory, trying to fix all this uh, during the grant administration. And the problem is that radical Republican, radical, radical Republican reconstruction is uh, much different from President Johnson's ideas of reconstruction. Radical reconstruction of um, uh, the South was very much a forward-looking uh, plan to give land to uh, to uh, freedmen, to give uh, to to set up freed schools, to prevent c Confederate officers and all kinds of other people from ever serving in the government again, from taking for taking. Uh, taking citizenship away from people like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis and, and generals and things like that. So it was pretty strong and pretty strict. Then, then Johnson, for all sorts of reasons, keeps picking at that, watering it down, and you get this, this, kind, of, this kind of mess. And in fact, I think it's the process through which Reconstruction gets ruined that explains how things happen in the Jim Crow period. But let's take this second question. How did African-Americans respond to emancipation? I can't see all of you on one screen, so just jump in. Don't raise your hand, just jump in. Um, well, they tried to uh, reconstruct families that had been separated by sales and tried to regain control of their children who'd been appointed to whites, uh, apprenticed to whites during the war through the black codes um, and formed like black churches and black colleges. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just gonna add in that some of them found jobs, but then, uh, you know, and became more independent, but some of them wanted to go back and work for their former uh, masters in a way, because that's what they felt like they belonged to, but. Some of them wanted to break away from that. Uh, okay, hold, hold on to that thought because uh, I really want to stress the flow of how things happen post, post emancipation and, and once the war is over. Okay, once the war is over, by the way, South is divided into military districts. So it's completely under the control of the, of the, of the army. But um, Delena is right. The first thing that people try to do is to find their relatives. Okay, I think that's highly significant because we talk so much in history about the politics of this and getting the vote and in economic history about getting land and sharecropping and all that kind of stuff. But the first thing, the very first thing freedmen, freed people try to do is find their relatives. Now, think off the top of your head, how difficult would that be to do? I mean, very difficult. There's like no like centralized places to search. You know, you can maybe put ads in newspapers, but there's no guarantee that your relatives will see those newspapers because they might be elsewhere. And that's what they do. They put ads in newspapers. They talk to the Freedmen's Bureau, tries to sort of set up uh, systems where this can be done more easily. But, you know, if you're sold in 18, 1858, if you, if you have a family member sold in your, from Tennessee, you have a family member sold in 1858, sold to someone in Chattanooga and you're in Nashville. Okay, they, they, then they're shipped all the way off to Chattanooga. And then two years later, that owner can turn around and sell them into North Carolina. So, you know, and a lot of these people don't have the records of their last names aren't kept or anything like that. So, all of a sudden, a person can be moved two, three, four hundred miles uh, within three or four years, and there, it's it's almost impossible to to figure out who is who is what, uh, who belonged to who, uh, family wise, not belonged to legally slavery wise. So, but I think, but I think that's highly significant. I think what historians argue, historians and spirits argue, is very, very significant that the family is the first thing that freed people think about. Then somebody else said something about schools and churches. What, what's that about? A lot of the churches um, re like doubled as schoolhouses. And so like a lot of the 
um, Friedman really kind of rushed there to learn, to read, to understand the, uh, the laws, policies, things like that. And it really created a, a central place for every single person uh, to come and to talk and discuss. And it really raised like the, um, their level in society. Uh, hang on one second. I'm gonna try to uh, find this um, thing for you. Uh, I can't find it now. I was going to show it to you. Uh, it, um, uh, oh, crap, what was I going to say? Before the Civil War and, and during the Civil War, African Americans worshipped and educated their children sort of in secret. Now, it's not, it's not widely accepted that it was, it was completely secret. Some masters wanted their their uh, slaves to to learn uh, basics of the Bible and basics of, of things in order because they felt like they would they would accept their their place in society more easily that way. But generally speaking, churches and schools for African Americans are were sort of underground, very much under the radar, if you will, until emancipation, and it's that. Emancipation is what allows them to go above the radar. And I think what Alice is saying is not surprising, therefore, that um, you have so many African-American churches, as in buildings and official congregations and, and trained pastors and all that kind of stuff starting in this period, African-American schools starting in this period, eventually what are known as the HBCU schools, historically black colleges and universities founded, most of them founded by the federal government uh, across the South. Um, this, this, this is a, another, another sort of social transformation, right? And it is one of the things that that's not talked about in the book enough, I think, is that an aspect of the different churches is they start to communicate with each other. And rather than, than the advertisements in newspapers, which do work sometimes, when African, when freed families are able to be reunited in some form or another, it's usually because one church spreads out the, the word to the other churches. And the other churches mention it in their, in their sermons or whatever. Um, sorry, I have my email, my campus email up while we're talking because I want to see whether we get canceled for, for next week while, while we're actually. So there, there's a, this whole network. It's not just if you live in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and uh, you, as, an, as a freed person, and you, you join your local church. It's not as if you're just suddenly, you're only in this little building by yourself. Gradually, you become connected with a, with a, a wider group, a wider uh, group of people. So if it's the case that looking for lost family members and the building of churches and schools are the first two things to happen, first two things American, African-Americans respond to, what does that say about that culture? This is, this is thinking off the top of your head time. This isn't. This isn't in the book. I mean, after all, for the most part, the vast majority, for the most part, freed people don't go in and murder their ex-masters out of revenge or anything like that. It almost never happens. Why do you think there's this family and this community uh, reaction first? I think um, because oh, they sorry, all... Go ahead. Uh, I think it's... <clears throat> From from my line of thinking, I, it seems as if it's because they've all just kind of been through the same thing mm -hmm. to some degree, and they've all been through a traumatic experiences, and that but they have each other to accept them, and and it's kind of like the only group within society that will accept them. It seems sure, yeah, 
And what were we going to say, Alice? Oh, that wasn't you? Okay. No, it was me. I was just going to, I was kind of saying the same thing as what he had said. Uh, they've all been kind of through it together and they just, they don't want to have anger. They just want to be reunited with their, their former families they probably haven't seen in so long. Yeah, I think what's, and I think this is the, the evidence for this emotional reaction, family reaction, family ties reaction can also be seen. And is the idea is supported by the fact that um, whenever uh, uh, slaves were either freed for whatever reason or, or gained their own freedom or granted their freedom when a master died or, or ran away uh, to, uh, to the North or whatever, the first thing, this is before the Civil War, the first thing they do is search for relatives, okay? So it meant something deep, obviously, in the human DNA. You know, that, that's, the, that's the first thing, that's the most important thing to you. So that's how, that's how historians know that that's the most important thing to people because that's the first thing they do, right? They don't immediately start trying to farm or whatever, you know, as, as you know, they're trying to, to feed it themselves, obviously, but the first major thing they do is try to is try to a rebuild their families or b and b connect to these wider wider um, um, uh, social structures in church and in school. Now, when it comes when when question two, when it comes to the discussion on Tuesday, note that. Uh, when we talk about the uh, Sherman's uh, the petition to the, the the people the Sherman meeting with African American freedmen, and and them expressing their wishes and desires, that's all part of this question too. Okay. They actually the, it actually happens. People come in and and the and the, not Sherman but um, uh, representatives and military governors say, okay, what 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 do you want? What do you need? And there are government secretaries, military secretaries sitting there taking shorthand, taking a word for word what these what these people are are asking for. Okay, because one of the first, sorry, I didn't mean to turn this into a lecture, but one of the first things Sherman notices by marching through the South is that uh, you know, I he realizes, ooh, I thought I knew what this was all about, but I really don't know. And the rest of the army doesn't know. The rest of the, the Washington government doesn't know. We better find out what these people want and need. Okay. So rather than walk in and be large and in charge immediately, he asks those questions. But I'm going to save that uh, for Tuesday. Uh, what role did terrorism play in Reconstruction? Well, we violence we by um, like organized groups such as like the KKK and like the white flights or whatever. Um, they targeted black people trying to exercise their rights and freedoms. It was often aimed at black people who tried to buy land or Republican politicians who supported civil rights. In the election of 1876, armed Democrats destroyed ballots and uh, drove African Americans away from the polls physically. Good. How about someone else? We need someone outside this sort of uh, layer of Delana, Madison, Alice, and Nick. Someone else who hasn't spoken up. Speak up. Josh, you're a veteran. You know what to say. You're a veteran of my classes. You know what to say. I mean, she worded it pretty well. I mean, you know, basically like, yeah, these groups like white supremacist groups such as like the KKK and you know, like they would basically like target these African-Americans using like, you know, tactics and intimidation to, you know, drive them away from polls so that, you know, the people that they want to, you know, win in, in these polls would like, you know, have more votes. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely, the, the the violence is very strong. The the reaction is very strong. The first KKK, this KKK that, that gets cracked down upon, 
and the, but then revives later KKK that we kind of know sort of comes from the 1880s, 1890s. Um, they, they, they lash out. And after all, don't forget, Grant has let all the Confederate soldiers go home with their horses and their weapons and their sidearms and that sort of stuff. Cannons and stuff get confiscated. Uh, so, you know, all of a sudden a farmer who might have had a hunting rifle might have had a hunting rifle. A lot of them didn't because they were just farming, not hunting, is now an armed <laughs> farmer. And if he feels his land is being threatened or taken away, uh, and if he can get enough of his pals to, to join together with him, then you do have these, these, uh, these terrible things happen. What else? Sorry, I'm in a, this chair is absolutely driving my back up the wall. How else did, how else was terror used during reconstruction? I feel as a general whole, it probably just scared people generally. Um, I feel like a lot of people were scared, scared to step out and do what they wanted to do as individuals mm -hmm. that were now free. Mm -hmm. And some people are lynched and some people are killed and, 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 and all those sorts of things. What effect do you think that might have had on the freed population? What, you know, what, what is it? At least a ra radical reconstruction, you, you, can, you, can, you can vote. You can go to sit in your state assembly, you know, but as all that stuff starts to fall apart and there are, you know, people threatening you, threatening your life, life to stay away from the polls, how do, how do most people react? Most free people, that is. They were probably too scared to exercise the, any of their rights that they were given after slavery was abolished. Yeah. I think among the worst things that uh, that presidential reconstruction does is it is it allows so, uh, former Confederate governments to go haywire and create all these crazy laws that then can be either that that are either discriminatory on the face of it or can be used in discriminatory ways and violent groups can be joined in. Uh, Brian is saying white Southerners use terrorism to end federal. Uh, uh, involvement in reconstruction to make a new era of racial repression. Sorry, I can't talk. There's a lot of background noise <laughs> here right now. Uh, yeah, there's background noise here. The next door neighbors are redoing their house. Yeah, no, and here's the key. Here's a key. There are a lot of, there are a lot of things. First of all, you could be, uh, after radical reconstruction ends and this sort of this terrorism moves in, if you go to the polls and try to vote, if you do all, a, a number of other things, the KKK or other groups could come and attack your family. Uh, I don't know if the, K, the first KKK does cross burnings on law, but let's just say they come and attack you. They attack you and your family at your house. Okay, that's bad. But then what happens is the KKK gradually starts to if you try to do something, if you as a free person, you try to go vote or you try to, 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 to uh, exercise some other right, they come and they attack your whole neighborhood, all right? This is a, a very, very severe change in how the KKK and other terrorist groups act, okay? So what do you think that does to the African-American community? How do they how do they respond to the fact that they you know somebody might not themselves have tried to vote they might have been scared off but the neighbor three doors down tried to vote and now they burn the whole neighborhood down what do you think is likely to happen within that freed community? Um, <clears throat> my my best guess would be well and and I actually just joined into this class today I just added it to my schedule um, but. I, I would think that they would be afraid to vote um, being like what they saw from people that have tried to vote and the things that the KKK and other people have done to them for that. And I, I feel like they would 
be afraid to exercise that that right. Okay. Also, what? Um, sorry, go. Who was going to say that? Who said? Oh, I was just going to say it seems like there would probably be a lot of social pressure. Um, preventing people from trying to exercise those rights because like you said now it's not just you being affected but somebody right. you know so people um, at large would kind of try to discourage you because they might be affected yeah i think this is extremely important it's one of the things that the, the warning group brought up was peer pressure you know yes we all want to vote but if if John Jones lives next door to me and goes and tries to vote. And the reaction to him voting is my house gets burned down and the whole neighborhood gets burned down. Then there's going to be, then there is going to be, and there was a lot of peer pressure within the free community to say, oh, well, no, wait a minute. <laughs> that voting was nice for a while, but it's not worth being killed, being lynched, being, uh, having our, our neighborhoods burned down and all, and on and on and on and on and on. So there's a, there builds up within the free community this kind of idea that you know it's not worth it we've got to stay we've got to stay close to stay we're being put down we got to stay be put down in order to remain alive so there's 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 important peer pressure in the free community now can you imagine there also being peer pressure in the white terrorist community now, obviously i'm not saying that all whites in the south were, were terrorists but of those whites who did move turn to terror is there another kind of a peer pressure group dynamic problem going on on that side of the equation um, what are you going to do if you're the if you're the third brother in in, in the in a in a group of five and you kind of, and all your other brothers have joined the KKK and you're kind of like eh, queasy about the KKK or all your friends have joined or, or, or what, what, what happens? Doesn't it develop like a, I want to say gang mentality, like an us versus them? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. There's peer pressure to join. There's peer pressure to do stuff. Now, this doesn't happen with everybody, obviously, but you, you see this, this happens throughout American history again and again and again. There's this all kinds of crap thrown up there. Well, the, the, the Negroes are trying to take over now. You've seen what they've done to the South Carolina legislature. That, that, oh, that, that's all black. We can't have that. And if you don't join the KKK, you're letting your race down. You're a man, you're a Confederate vet. Sure, you were only a private or a corporal or whatever, but you were allowed to bring your rifle home. So actually, I don't know if you're allowed to bring your rifle. I shouldn't say that. Maybe you were, I can't remember. Uh, I think there were people, I know they were allowed to bring sidearms home. So I don't, so anyway, but, but there are a hell of a lot more armed people than there were before. So, you know, if you're constantly under pressure, peer pressure to, to, to conform to a certain way of thinking and then worse, a certain way of action, an awful lot of people get roped in. It's very, very hard to, to uh, withstand that peer pressure. All right, well, how did, why, I should say, did Reconstruction end? First of all, let's take President Johnson, Andrew Johnson's role in sort of ruining the Republicans' early ideas of Reconstruction. Although he did support the emancipation, he didn't support the idea that, you know, African Americans deserved, you know, any type of um, rights other than the emancipation. It was a bit weird. It's kind of like he, he was just doing it for a show in a way, but then he wanted to just continue with his almost, you know, really racist beliefs that they didn't belong. And that kind of took like steps back. There was progress, but then 
with Johnson as president, a lot of people believed in that and they probably followed his beliefs too as well. Yeah, there's this very, very clear race. Uh, there, there's a very clear case where it seems like there's two steps forward and three steps back. Uh, uh, let me, let, Nick, let me call on somebody, uh, somebody else jump in here with this, this as well. What, let's, again, let's focus on Johnson. What, what is Johnson's background? Johnson is a white unionist Democrat from Tennessee. He's the only Senator from a Confederate state to stay in Washington and, and, and still represent his state. Right? Everyone else goes home. He's very anti-planter. He's, he's against the plantation class. He's a, uh, that you you would think that would make him anti-slavery too, or anti or or pro-black civil rights too, but it doesn't. What he's focusing on is the small white planter. But as Madison says, he's just this racial thing continues. He can't get around the idea that African Americans are being elected to office. So how does that then affect how Reconstruction ends? Isn't the Compromise of 1877 kind of the, the ending period for everything to where yeah. they agreed to put Southern Democrats return to power if Hayes could become president? Yeah, it's but remember, like a... thing, things deteriorate even before that. And they're deteriorating because Johnson is doing everything he can to return power to the states and the localities. And the states and localities are all in control of, of white people who are very, very interested in keeping African Americans down. So you get this kind of mixture after radical reconstruction ends, presidential reconstruction ruins everything. Uh, and people in the North, for instance, start to get sick of hearing about the South, sick of hearing about problems in the South. They just want to cut it off, let it drift out to sea. Um, he tries to veto um, the Civil Rights Act of uh -huh. uh, 1866. It was the first piece of legislation to be, or major legislation for uh, the veto to be overridden. And he also offers uh, pardons to all the Southerners, except for if your property pre-war was over like $20,000, you had to ask for like an individual pardon, yeah. uh, which goes in with his whole anti-big uh, planters thing. But yeah, he basically like opposes it at, at any opportunity he gets. And it's pretty hard to fight that off. If the president is doing something, the president has all the has all control of the executive branch, control of the army and everything else, he can he can sort of determine how things a lot of things happen on the ground. And Congress is just getting sicker and sicker of this whole mess. Right. And so then, as Madison says, when the election of 1876, oh crap, my screen just, my screensaver just kicked in. This always happens to me. Um, when the election of 1876 comes around and is disputed in South Carolina, Louisiana, three states, I can't remember which, the whole, Florida. yeah, yeah that, that's right, uh, are, are sort of disputed and up for grabs. Uh, then this whole backroom deal starts to, to be made. And I hate to say it because there are so many bad periods and grubby and, and backroom dealing and, and really awful politicking involved in the history of every country, but this is one of the worst. And the fact that, that, that so too many people in the North are wanting to just wash their hands of the situation and just say, I am, am sick of hearing about the South. I just want it to stop. And the fact that they're willing to uh, end Reconstruction if, 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 if Hayes is allowed to be elected to office, just 
and, and by the way, if, if you ever want to read the details of this, I mean, the, 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 back, the backroom trading, the absolute outright bribes and threats and all kinds of other stuff, it's just, it's just awful. It's this banana republic sort of stuff. So effectively, the government gives up in, in, in 1977, 1877. I'm not sure if this lines up uh, in a timeline of sorts, but um, like socially, there were things like indentured servitude um, that kind of kept uh, former slaves hands tied because they couldn't get employed anywhere. And that was kind of their only option. I don't know if that lines up in time uh, with. No. No. Indentured servitude doesn't exist in the 19th century. It's an 18th century thing. Okay. Uh, what ha what does happen is the, there's a move to sharecropping, but we'll we'll talk about that on Tuesday. All right. So was Reconstruction a success or a failure, or both? We tend to think of it as a failure, but are there some successful things that happened during that period? Um, I think that. Oh, but yeah, Juliet, Juliet was was about to say. Uh, I would say it's a uh, partial success. Um, yep. The emancipation and the uh, 14th and 15th Amendment uh, marked a milestone in the U.S. history. However, there was a failure to properly embrace all the change. Maybe I think it's like too, it was, uh, some people were too shocked by the idea that now you had the former slaves as your equal. So they kind of uh, didn't want to really accept that. That's why they try to do like all these things to kind of keep away uh, former slaves from having the same rights as them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's very important. The, certainly the, the big three, the 13, 14, 15 amendments, extremely important. And, and I don't think anyone would disagree that they they're morally the right thing to do, and and um, uh, uh, were the best things for the country in terms of those uh, problems that they tended to solve. And take, for instance, the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment becomes extremely important in later decades when Chinese Americans are trying to fight for the right to citizenship. They're able to use the Fourteenth Amendment, which wasn't, which was mainly about African Americans but didn't mention African-Americans by name, by specific types, just as race. Well, that was able to grant, uh, that was able to get rid of what's known as the Chinese Exclusion Act and all kinds of other things and determine that the United States does have birthright citizenship. That all comes from the, from the 14th Amendment. So these are huge things that make it, uh, as Julius says, a partial success. What about the failure part? Well, it ultimately failed because it didn't live up to the promises of upholding, you know, the, I mean, of course, the 13th Amendment was upheld, but it didn't really protect all the rights that were promised under the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, the federal government never committed the required resources to exert federal power over the South. And like you said, they just kind of gave up, especially with the backroom deal of uh, 1877. Right, you see what well, there's a limitation on the 15th amendment, for instance, the 15th amendment says you can't discriminate against people in their civil rights, their, their right to vote based on race, color or previous condition of servitude. You can't discriminate on those three things, but that kind of leaves the door open. You could discriminate in all kinds of other things, right? You can have literacy tests, you can have uh, grandfather clauses, you could have all kinds of stuff as long as it's not tied down to race, uh, create a race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So of course, the first thing that that uh, that Southern governments do practically is they come up with all these other in uh, 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 these ways to snake around and get around the Fifteenth Amendment by having literacy tests, having all kinds of things to stop people from actually voting. 
Now let me just let me just add this one thing to it. What this does, um, among many other things, what this does, the fact that there are the literacy tests or or property or poll taxes or grandfather clauses or whatever, it makes every little podunk town's council extremely powerful, and it makes the person who's sitting, who's the the re, the clerk of elections or the register of election, whatever they call them in, in different towns, sitting there at the polling booth, that person becomes extremely powerful because that person can decide to whom to give a literacy test and to whom not to give. So a white person strolls up to the, to the polls and they say, oh, hi, Bill. Yep, go mark your ballot. A, a black person shows up to the poll and they say, okay, well, you're here. Let's, you have to do your literacy test in order to, to, um, to, um, to vote. And the literacy tests were ridiculous. They were just, you know, you have to have memorized the constitution. You have to have memorized the state constitution. You have to, have, they do all kinds of stuff. There are these intelligence tests. How many bubbles are in a bar of soap? It, it was just, it was just uh, crazy and immoral. But that person, that guy, and it was a man at that stage, suddenly becomes an extremely important, powerful person in his community. And that just enhances his degree of willingness to exercise that, that power. Right? All of a sudden, ha ha, well, I can determine who votes and who doesn't. That's a pretty big deal. Um, and that gets reinforced through the generations. So you get exactly the same kind of people doing exactly the same kind of thing well into the 1950s and 1960s. Okay. It's not surprising that, and that only reinforces the kind of clannishness of uh, people who are trying to keep African Americans from their civil rights. My daddy was a poll worker. My his daddy was a poll worker, and they did it this way, and I'm going to do it this way, and. And until the federal government steps in again in 1965, well, within your parents, probably your parents' birth, parents' lifetime, well, within, within my lifetime, barely, but within, uh, and stops that, um, you know, it's, it's a feature of American life. Okay, what, 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 let me ask you this final question before we go. What did you learn about Reconstruction by doing your reading? What did you learn about reconstruct reading and listening to the lecture? What did you do about your what did you learn about reconstruction that you didn't know before? Generally I think, speaking. I think I was shocked by how much I didn't know and how much my high school did not teach uh, because it briefly talked about um, reconstruction, but not fully the whole problems African Americans faced and all the um, things that were done to restrict their freedoms. Mm -hmm. and by the way, this keeps going. You know, the Jim Crow era is the next thing that happens. And that lasts until 19, uh, 1965. Some people, some people claim that, that, that Southern governments are, are starting to do the same sort of thing again by taking voting, voting places, polls out of uh, African American or poor neighborhoods, and moving them, making it harder for people. Now that, as a story, I'm not, uh, I don't want to talk about whether I think that's happening because that's we need some time to to analyze it. But um, you can imagine how embittering that is for generations and generations of people. Okay, um, I knew nothing about the the Freedmen Bureau from high school. We, you know, we weren't taught like intensive amounts of anything in high school, I don't think, but um, how their company kind of, or business kind of failed in a way because they were made to give the land back to the ex-Confederates anyways, but they wanted to give them to the new freed people, but they couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, kind of going off of what Madison said, I didn't know about, um, you know, the amount of political participation that there was on the part of African-Americans before Reconstruction kind of started falling apart, like um, 
the participation in the, the South Carolina uh, writing of the constitution, rewriting mm -hmm. of their state constitution. You know, I just didn't know that there was a period where, where some people were able to play a role and then it was just kind of taken away. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. And South Carolina is a particularly bad example because they go through I think, three constitutions written in a short period because they're trying to uh, rejig the system back to the way it was before, before the, uh, the reconstruction constitution of the state. Uh, I was going to say something about that, and I just now forgotten. Um, no, I can't remember what I was going. What else did some of you learn? Um, I I would say like a big a big thing that we didn't talk about was the sort of peer pressure that people were faced with, because it it seems like through like the big decision of emancipation um it seemed to divide people a lot and you're either on one side or the other and whether you're on either side it kind of forces your hand it not forces your hand but it kind of like pushed people into action and the people that you're surrounded by are acting so you're kind of almost forced to not not necessarily forced to but you're very heavily yeah. pressured to and we didn't really talk about that so much yeah that's it that's a that's something that that's you know you have to get to higher levels of of study history before you you, you talk about that stuff and, and jonathan's saying i never really knew how much president johnson tried to step in the way of progress that's certainly that's certainly uh uh very very true uh well, let me say one final thing, and that is, it, it is amazing to me, and I think it's amazing to historians, how much the South was let off the hook or got away with, wherever, wherever you want to express it, um, uh, bringing the, got, got away with bringing the Civil War on the country. I can't think of any other defeated group of rebels, I can't think of any other defeated country, I can't think of any other defeated entity that basically gets everything handed back to them. It's almost, almost as if nothing had happened. It, uh, what I think what most historians will argue, and you can't really argue this because it's two separate time periods, but since we know that Reconstruction was such a failure, and since we know that the, the return of what was known as the redemption governments, the white governments coming back into the South was proved to be so viciously racist. What needed to happen in the South in, in reconstruction was what happened in Germany after World War II. And that is a denazification, right? Uh, Nazis, as you know, they, they went on trial. Nazis above a certain rank were never allowed to hold public office or, or, or all kinds of other things in post-war Germany, and that stripped out that sort of extremism in German life afterwards. That didn't happen from 1865 to 1877, okay? Now, partly because Lincoln said, well, you know, let's, we want liberality all around. We don't want to have retribution and all that sort of stuff. But clearly what needed to happen was a sort of deconfederatization <laughs> that was similar to, to denazification. And in fact, the, if, if people had listened to the Republicans in Congress at the time, that's what they were pushing for. Okay. So the fact that that didn't happen and it takes until 1945 and the post-1945 period for something like that to happen is a pretty, uh, pretty stark slap in the face to, to, uh, about, about human nature. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, uh, so you did a pretty good job of, of discussing things. I would have liked to have seen more people jump in. So I'm gonna get, uh, I'm not going to um, assign questions to people for Tuesday's discussions. Tuesday's discussion is gonna be like today, except you're gonna be looking at the documents in your reader. Those discussion questions are gonna go up tonight on Canvas. So make sure to pay attention to those. And uh, I will see all of you in person, we hope, yes, 
on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. All right. Adios. Thanks. Have a good one. Have a good day. Do you need us to watch that movie too before Tuesday? No, just if you want to. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't know if that was part of the discussion or anything. No, no. That we 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 could we could spend a whole year talking about reconstruction, but we don't have time. So. Okay, so that was just some supplemental material if we wanted to watch it, but you don't have to have us watch it. Okay. No, and I think every American should watch Birth of a Nation, but you don't have to do it for for Tuesday. Okay, thank do, you. Do it in your spare time is kind of a, a hobby. It's a very, very, very stark and upsetting movie. Alice, were you going to ask me something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know if you have, like, like off the top of your head, any, like, information about the American Equal Rights Association, because I found it, like, really interesting, but then I couldn't really find anything, like, really substantial about it. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, Reconstruction is not my my specific period of research but uh uh did you google it and all that standard stuff yeah it was like all like the same paragraph over and over again yeah so. uh, well unfortunately i think because of one of these smallish groups it it tends not to be uh talked about enough but let's talk about it on tuesday and how how you might be able to find out more info and i'll i'll look too while in in the interim all right, thank you. Okay, adios.